points. Um, so who's this guy standing in front of you? Um, I've been doing management of large IP networks since about 1998, 99. Uh, started my first real large scale gig was at NASA, the NASA International Sciences Network. Uh, I used to work also for a vendor called Concord, which made a product called eHealth. Anybody ever use that? All right, I know one person who was just in here. Yeah, there's Billy. Um, worked for Bell South after that. They, uh, they tried to mold my cranium into the shape of a bell. Um, it took me a few years to recover from that. And now I work for the OpenNMS group, so I get to do the things that I love. I get to play with managing networks and systems at scale, and I get to hack on free software. So basically what I'm telling you is I'm working my dream job right now. How many people here are already familiar with OpenNMS? Okay, that's probably about average. I think we've got four. So I'll, I want to open a little bit with, um, with a, well, first of all, a few other questions. How many people in here know about software-defined networks already? Like, would consider yourself fluent in the terminology? Yeah. How many have actually hacked on SDN stuff or set up an SDN installation of some kind? Okay. Um, so most of my experience with this, for those of you who have actually done this stuff, is pretty much lab and theoretical. So take it easy on me. Um, how many have used SNMP before? Did you use it to send mail? Okay, good. You passed the test. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about what used to be in the old school networks. So for some of you, this will be massive overview. Um, we used to have switches in old school networks, right? We kind of still have these around. Before that, we called them hubs. They were just electrical repeaters. Um, switches are a little smarter than that. They are good at switching layer two frames and running STP, spanning tree protocol, and that's pretty much what a pure switch does, right? It's a pretty compartmentalized thing. Um, you'll, you'll often have these things with a lot of physical ports, 24, 48, more. And um, sometimes they're modular, sometimes they're fixed configuration. They tend to have a high throughput data plane, and um, their configuration is stored locally, typically. So any of you who have configured a Cisco switch, you know you SSH in, you blow in your configuration, and it lives right there on the switch. And that's the way it is, and it's pretty terrible. Then we've got routers as we go up the, uh, the OSI stack. We get to layer three, and we make routers which are good at forwarding layer three packets, typically IP. Um, I've seen IPX and Apple talk and other unmentionable things in my earlier days of managing networks, but we're just going to talk about IP. Um, they're also good at running routing protocols, some of them, OSPF, BGP, ISIS, um, EIGRP, that just make them smarter at deciding which interface a given IP packet should go out. Compared to switches, your routers tend to have fewer physical ports. Um, they're often modular, like the switches. They're pretty rarely fixed configuration. They have a medium to high throughput data plane, and their control <coughs> plane, which is what controls their behavior, is run from a locally stored configuration. So you SSH in, and you blow in your configuration, or you do it through some terrible web UI, but the config lives right there on the box. You should be starting to get angry. Are you getting angry yet? Okay. Good, um, and then we're gonna go up a few levels here and talk about firewalls. Um, basically, they're still just doing forwarding of layer three packets, subject to some kind of rule set. Um, often that, that rule set goes all seven layers. They're also really good for if you need somebody to point the finger at when stuff breaks in your IT, right? Firewalls are terrible, everybody hates them, and having worked as a firewall engineer for a couple of years, um, yeah, it's not any fun. Um, much like routers, you tend to have relatively few physical ports on a firewall. Um, sometimes they're modular, sometimes they're fixed config. Low to medium throughput data plane compared to routers, because these tend to sit in front of a small number of typically server kind of hosts, right? Even if you're using something like Checkpoint that's got a pretty good system for managing your, uh, your firewall configurations and pushing them as revisions, they're still ultimately living right out there on the device, and this is a travesty. So to try to wrangle some of this complexity in our old school networks, we've built 
things. Uh, we built configuration management. How many people here are using some sort of configuration management system? How many of you are using a spreadsheet for your configuration management? Yep, more people do than will admit it. Um, so yeah, the, the idea behind some behind most of your configuration management platforms is to make sure that the right configurations are running on the right devices, hopefully with the right revisions. Um, configuration management, another part of its job is to account for the hardware and software elements in your network. They're also configuration management platforms really great at eating up your time and your money. Now we, we break this down a little bit, making the right configs run on the right devices and accounting for the elements in your network are really two separate problems, and each one of those is pretty hard. So I give configuration management vendors a bit of a break. Um, they're, they're doing really two pretty hard jobs, and some of them do it pretty well. Um, but even the ones that do it pretty well, typically the config management platform doesn't grok what the configs mean, right? It doesn't have any contextual awareness of what it means if OSPF is turned on in a big single area zero in all of your network. It doesn't, it doesn't know what that means. It just knows that that's your configuration that's running in all your network. Um, also, the, the accounting for all the nodes in your network, how do you know that they're all in your configuration management system? You run some kind of discovery thing, right? But how do you know that that caught everything? So really hard, really difficult problems to solve. Um, Vendors, both proprietary and open source, are doing it pretty well. So let's pile some more software on the problem. Now we're going to have network management systems. All right, so I assume most of you probably have done network management, whether you know it or not. The kids call it monitoring, I'm told, instead of network management. Um, yeah, so there are a couple of different ways to break down the functionality in the network management platform. Um, probably the most well-known is the OSI FCAPS model. Who's heard of this before? <coughs> okay, so FCAPS is Fault Configuration Accounting Performance and Security Management. Um, the platform that I work on and the ones that I've worked on in the past that were real things and not just somebody's toy project pretty much adhere to this model. OpenNMS is no exception. Um, our focus is primarily on fault and performance. As I said before, configuration is a really hard problem that a lot of other people do well. Accounting, we just haven't gone there yet. And security, we tend to do through integrations with other things. So that's our fault, fault performance. We've also been around since 1999, um, which is probably older than some of the people walking around the conference today, which is kind of terrifying when you get right down to it. Um, but that means we've also seen a lot of stuff. All right, we've, we've seen the demise predicted of various things, and some of them actually went away, some of them didn't go away. So the way we implement the FCAPS model in OpenNMS, we really kind of break everything down into four parts. We used to say there are two halves to OpenNMS, and then there were three, and now there's four halves, and we just say there's four parts. Um, so the, the first and probably the most important part of how we break down FCAPS is provisioning. Now, if you're in the telco world, provisioning means a particular thing to you. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the process of getting nodes, interfaces, and services under management, getting them into the inventory of your network management system, OpenNMS in this case. The second piece is what we call service assurance. That's basically knock knock, is anybody there? Um, we can do things like ping an IP address and see if we get an echo reply from it. Uh, we can do much more complicated things than that too. Fault management, how can we become aware that a network element has a problem? Sometimes without reaching out and polling it for its availability. Um, so that's, that's fault management. And then performance management, which is probably the most visible and uh, sexiest of all of these, is going out and quantifying data via some performance management protocol, i.e perhaps SNMP, perhaps something different, um, to find out things like how busy is your CPU, how much data is flowing through your network interfaces, how full is that file system, how many people are currently logged in, right? That's our performance management piece. We do a lot with SNMP. 
So a little bit about what SNMP does for those of you who haven't used it before. SNMP stands for the Simple Network Management Protocol. And yes, the simple might be construed as a cool joke on users by developers. Uh, who knows why SNMP is called simple? All right, in the original spec, there were only five protocol operations. Get, get next, get reply, set, and trap. Um, it's grown over the years since then, but that, that's really the core of what the SNMP is for. Um, so you, you can actually break all of that down into really two things. One is a management platform of some kind, for instance, OpenNMS, reaches out via SNMP and asks a node, hey, how many bytes have been through that interface? How full is that file system? And the node, if we're lucky, and we got everything configured right, replies and says, here's the number for that piece of data that you asked me for. Um, the other mode of operation for SNMP is managed node to manager unsolicited messages. So that, that's what we call in SNMP lingo a trap. Uh, technically, they're called notifications in SNMP v2 and later, but trap. In the SNMP world, the devices that are moving the data is really where all the action is, right? So that's, that's where you want to focus your performance management and your other things too, for that matter. There's, there's not a lot of excitement apart from the devices that are actually moving the data around on your network. So we talk to the SNMP agent directly on the managed node. That's how it's always been. Um, there are a few cases where we need to proxy something through another system, but most of the time we talk SNMP directly to the nodes that we're managing. Um, and we can gather all kinds of stuff, right? We can get interface traffic, we can get stat uh, statistics about BGP connections, peerings, um, we can get environmental statistics, how humid is it in your data center, how hot is it, um, you get chassis intrusion kind of things. The great thing about SNMP is that it's massively extensible, has this concept of a management information base. It's a self-describing thing that lets you build in things that nobody ever thought of before. It's pretty cool, it's pretty powerful. So to summarize a little bit about how old school networks are and were, you've got a bunch of nodes running around doing their own thing. Their configurations are stored locally and those are driving the control plane, which is what makes the decisions about things like switching frames, forwarding packets. Um, you, you've gotta be skilled to build a network in this way, but there's also an element of luck, right? Any network engineers here? Yeah, so there's definitely an element of luck in building networks this way. You gotta wait for your routing protocols to converge. Your configuration management platform doesn't know how it's going to work. Sometimes it's a lot of trial and error and just good old grit to, to have done this stuff before to make it work properly. All this boils down to it's impossible to simulate accurately how the network's going to perform. You can try simulation stuff. They're expensive, good technologies to simulate traffic. But at the end of the day, you can't write unit tests for it. And that sucks. Hackers did not design this world, right? Yeah. Okay, so here's what the new world's going to look like, I promise. Trust me. If you take away just one fact about software-defined networks from this talk, it is this. Software-defined networking is all about the separation of the control plane from the data plane and also programmability. Pretty simple? That makes sense to everybody? Is this news to anybody? Cool, all right. So in the world of SDN, we kind of squash some concepts down. Everything is now called a switch. So whether the, um, whether the devices that are implementing the data plane are moving frames by switching them, moving packets by routing them, making decisions about TCP connections based on a firewall-ish set of rules, um, they're called switches and they're getting their marching orders from a controller. This means that the configurations are no longer pushed out to the device edge. Yay, we're, we're a little bit more centrally controlled and deterministic. Um, switches in an SDN environment tend to be a little bit more generic hardware-wise. You're still gonna have your ASICs to make their, their switching performance super mega fast. 
there are still vendors out there building these things, right? Cisco and Juniper and their ilk are not in any real danger from this world as long as they're good at building hardware to, to move data around, great. But it's gonna be more generic than it was. Sometimes the switches are even virtual. Why not? Um, and like I said, even if it's doing something at layer three through seven, we still call it a switch. We just stomp on this terminology, everything's now a switch. So what's driving the switches? A thing called a controller. Um, control plane, data plane, now we're talking about the control plane. The job of the controller is, surprisingly, to control the behavior of the switches, which are implementing the data plane. It does this according to centrally managed rules, which makes your job of configuring your network easier. It does this across all of the nodes that have registered to the controller, which makes the job of keeping track of what's in your network a lot easier. Pretty cool. And once you've got a controller populated with a bunch of switches registered to it, it exposes all that inventory and all those configurations via theoretically a set of open APIs, which is pretty great. Um, you can also have scripting hooks to make your network programmable. They tend to be done in Python. So if you like Python, that's great. If you don't like Python, sorry. I'm not crazy about it either, some of its elements, but it's a pretty good language. At the end of the day, the controller, though, is just a general purpose computer, right? It's not really a specialized piece of hardware. It doesn't doesn't have that much to differentiate it from the server that's running Apache over in the corner. Um, it might have a vendor's logo tattooed on it, might not. It might even be virtual too, just like some of your switches might be virtual. So to summarize a little bit about what the future is going to be like, we're gonna have relatively dumb switches reporting to a relatively smart controller. We're gonna be able to get central access to the inventory of switches and the configurations that are implementing their behavior in the data plane. Um, we're gonna be able to do some really cool, wacky, agile stuff through network programmability, assuming that the vendors who keep the sector somewhat under their thumb for now allow it. Um, and now there's a lot less luck involved, right? It's gonna be primarily a game of skill to program your networks to work the way you want them. You might even be able to write unit tests for your network, guys. How cool is that? Any unit testers, people? You like a green bar? No unit test people? Oh, come on. Come talk to me if you don't already have unit testing religion. It's pretty cool stuff. End of the day, this is how hackers would build a network. All right? it's, it's much more deterministic way to live and to move your traffic around. So I decided I would do a little case study, right? I've, I've got to do something concrete. I can talk about concepts all day long, and that's great, but it doesn't help very much. Um, so I did a bit of a little tiny proof of concept thing. Decided I would play around with a controller and a few switches. Um, this is really generic stuff. The controller that I chose for this was Project Floodlight, which is an Apache licensed thing. Uh, comes from a company called Big Switch Networks. They're building an open flow controller. It supports open flow 1.0 through 1.4. Um, and yeah, you can find it at projectfloodlight.org. You can download it. It's a Java project, so sorry if you hate Java. Um, but it's built with Maven. It's a pretty simple thing to download and get running. Um, I had it up and running within about 30 minutes of finding it. And it just kind of works. For my switches, I spun up actually just a bunch of uh, EC2 instances running Fedora 21. This was a while back before Fedora 22 came out. And installed all the open vSwitch tooling on those guys. So these are just Linux boxes, right? Remember we said your switches are pretty much generic hardware. Um, open vSwitch is also Apache licensed. It implements OpenFlow 1.3, so we know that it's compatible with that range that's covered by Project Floodlight. The maintainership of Open vSwitch is distributed, which is pretty cool, kind of like Linux itself. There are kernel space implementations of Open vSwitch in both Linux and FreeBSD, and there's a user space implementation in NetBSD. So that's not gonna be quite as performant, but since it's NetBSD, you can run it on your toaster, right? So whatever you wanna run it on, NetBSD will run there. And that project is at openvswitch.org. Um, 
Okay, so those are the elements of the little case study that I put together. So let's break down this case study into the four core concerns of how OpenNMS implements FCAPs. First is provisioning. And I really had two options to look into for how to do provisioning when I integrate with Project Floodlight. Um, one is have the controller push its inventory into our REST API for provisioning. Um, that leans on the SDN controller's internal programming hooks. Option two, have OpenNMS go out, talk to the controller, and pull inventory from the controller's REST APIs. Either way, we're doing a REST API thing, right? It's just which way are we doing it, and who's driving the synchronization. So let's dig in a little bit to what push mode was going to mean. Um, sorry, this is code. You're probably all pretty comfortable looking at code. You don't really have to understand this too much. But uh, Project Floodlight does feature a pluggable notification manager. So anytime you add a switch, anytime a switch registers to the controller, um, there is an interface you can implement that says, here's what to do when you get a new switch attached to you. Uh, the default implementation basically just squawks to syslog. It's pretty dumb. Uh, it's not terribly useful. But since it's an interface in Java, you can override it in your own code. And since Floodlight is Apache licensed, you can do whatever you want with it in that way. Um, so in theory, we could just write a new notification manager for Floodlight that instead of squawking to syslog only, also does a post to OpenNMS's requisition REST endpoint or whatever other management system. Um, or we could just watch the logs, right? Just scrape the logs for messages that say, hey, a new switch or registered to me. Here's his IP address. Here's his MAC address. Here's all the other stuff that you need to know about it. Uh, dirty, but probably effective. On the whole, the push model from the controller to OpenNMS didn't seem like the cleanest approach to me, but it's probably pretty effective. Um, and if anybody has hacked on Floodlight or another SDN controller platform and wants to come tell me how wrong I am about this, please feel free. Uh, so the other option for provisioning integration was pull mode, wherein OpenNMS goes out, talks to Floodlight's REST APIs to find out what's in there. Um, this actually was a little bit easier to, uh, to conceptualize for me because the endpoint core controller switches in their REST API gives me, hey, look at that, a list of switches that are registered to the controller. So we have here, look at this, I'm going to dig out my laser pointer that was in my conference bag and actually use it. Look at that. It's even bright enough. So yeah, we've got an INET address, which is just the IP address. Uh, this slash is leftovers from the way Java renders IP address objects. Connected since, this is a millisecond since January 1st, 1970 thing. Switch DPID. This is a data path ID. Near as I can tell, it's just a MAC address, more or less. So this would be like the manageability MAC address of the switch. So that makes a pretty good unique identifier for a switch and a controller. Uh, and then here's our other switch. We got Wash and Zoe. Who gets that? Anybody? Any brown coats? No, oh, come on, geez. All right. Um, so yeah, Zoe is at a different IP address, uh, has been connected, uh, looks like not quite as long as Wash, and has a different data path identifier, so we can tell these two switches apart. So we need to know more information than just that, right? We'd like to know yeah, who, who made this switch? What version of whatever software it's running is it running? So we know from looking at this other core slash switch slash plug in the data path identifier and ask for it as JSON format. And we get what version of OpenV switch is running on it. Uh, I don't know who Nasira Inc. is. Does anybody know who that is? I'm guessing that's like who started the OpenV switch project. Couldn't find much information on them. Uh, hardware description is open vSwitch, pretty generic stuff, right? Here's the, the git hash of open vSwitch that we're running on there. No serial number, no data path description. Um, I would love to have some real, like, I don't know, Arista switches or Nexuses that can talk to an open flow controller and see what kind of stuff I get out of those, but I don't have any of those in my lab. So if anybody's got some of those and has ever tried this, I'd love to hear what your results were. We can dig even, dig even farther down than just the details about the switch itself as a node. Uh, 
if you go into core switch data point, I, I'm sorry, data path identifier slash port desk, you're going to get a JSON document out of Floodlight that says, okay, here's what's running and here are the ports. It's, this is just a JSON array describing all the network ports on the switch. So here's everything we need to know. Port number one has this hardware address. Here's its name, ETH1. Config and state are equivalent to the SNMP concepts of uh, if admin status and if offer status. Um, current speed and max speed, this is like if speed or if high speed. And this is the difference between current and maximum speed is not really expressed in a standard way in SNMP. So this is cool new knowledge. And then there's some other stuff. So yeah, you repeat this n times where n is how many interfaces the switch has. So given all this information, any OpenNMS users in here might recognize this document. This is what we call a model import or requisition. Um, we can build this XML document that tells OpenNMS, hey, you've got a node called Wash. His foreign ID is, and we'll plug in his data path ID that we got out of the floodlight controller's endpoint. Here's his IP address for management. Here's his status. And we're going to go ahead and say that he is an SNMP primary interface. I'll get to why in a minute here. Um, and here's Zoe. She's got a different foreign ID, different IP address for management. That IP address is also primary for SNMP manageability. Does everybody see how this maps back to the data that we got out of the floodlight controller? Makes sense? Cool. So once we import all of this data into OpenNMS, we've now got two nodes in OpenNMS. And the cool thing is, not to dig too much in and toot our own horn about how cool our uh, provisioning subsystem is, but if one of these switches goes away later from the OpenFlow controller's inventory, the next time you synchronize OpenNMS to this data source, the node's going to disappear from our inventory too, which means you don't have to worry about decommissioning your switch in two different places. If it goes away from the controller, it goes away from your management system too. Okay, so that's provisioning. 